the introduction to Hebrews is so fascinating. It's so rich. It's so full. It's just packed with life-changing truth. I just can't speed past it. Is that okay with you? So let's review for a moment where we were last week in the opening session. We called it Jesus, the language of God. Now, why did we call it that? Because the point of verses 1 and 2 is that the author of Hebrews is going to clearly establish one primary fact that God is speaking. God has always spoke. God wants to speak into our lives. What I failed to say Sunday is that as God is speaking, the book opens with that and it closes with that. In chapter 12, verse 25, there's 13 chapters. And in chapter 12, verse 25, he begins to bring the letter to conclusion by saying, see then that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those on the earth refused him, how will we escape if we refuse him who is speaking from heaven? We have the complete, the full revelation of God's truth. That's why we explained last week, God spoke, and you might want to note this, I'm not going to re-preach last week, but let me just get us to where we are today at the end of verse 2. God spoke in a fragmented way in the Old Covenant. It says, long ago, in many times, and in many ways. That was from Abraham to Malachi. That was that period of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. But then he says, this is how God spoke. It was in a fragmented way. He spoke many times, many ways. He spoke through law. He spoke through commandments. He spoke through precepts. He spoke through poetry. He spoke through prophets. He spoke through dreams and through visions and multiple ways that God spoke, but it was not full and complete. So the author says, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by his son. We said last week, the original there means in son. In other words, that's the language of God. How does God speak today? He speaks through Christ. And so that means every miracle that Jesus did, every parable that he taught, every principle that he laid down, every good work that he did, his life, his coming, his death, his burial, his resurrection, Everything about Jesus speaks to humanity today. Why is it the last days? Because there's not another word after Jesus. Jesus Christ is the final and decisive word of God to humanity. That's why if you're looking for hope anywhere other than Jesus, you'll never find it. If you're looking for truth anywhere other than the Son of God, Jesus Christ, you'll never find it. If you're looking for a path to God, any other way than the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, it does not exist because God's final and decisive word is Jesus Christ. He is the language of God. Can we thank God for that today? Amen. Ah, I love it. Now, I want to dive in today. Many people ask me, how far are we going to get in Hebrews this week? which I said, not far. I'm sorry. (laughs) I want to deal with two phrases today. The end of verse two. So now we understand God spoke through the prophets, old covenant in these last days, the new covenant, God speaking in son, in the language of Jesus. I want to call today Jesus, the heir of all things. What the writer of Hebrews is going to masterfully do He's going to present seven glories of Christ. You remember the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke chapter 9? You remember what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah appeared representing what? The law and the prophets. How did God speak verse 1? Through the prophets. Many times, many ways. But in these last days... He speaks in son. Now, Moses and Elijah appears and completely flips Peter out 
And Peter goes, we'll build churches. We'll build structures. This is amazing. We'll build each of you. And Peter wasn't even a builder. He was a fisherman. Flips him out. And you know what verse 35 says of Luke chapter 9? It says that all of a sudden, a bright cloud appears and a voice, God Almighty speaks. This is my son. And what did God Almighty say? Listen to him. Friends, how is God speaking in son? God is not speaking as a judge. Thank God. He's not speaking like he did at Mount Sinai. He's not speaking like he one day will at the great white throne judgment in this age of grace, in this church age, from Pentecost to Harpazzo, in this age of grace. How is God speaking? Through his son. When God spoke through the law and through the prophets, that was the mind of God. It was the light of God revealing the mind of God. But in these last days, in Son, in Jesus, by His Son, how is He speaking? He is speaking through love. And what does it reveal? The heart of God. The old covenant's the mind of God. The new covenant's the heart of God. The old covenant is the light of God. The new covenant is the love of God. I love Hebrews. It's like going to a steak buffet. I'm just, ooh, it's so good. Okay. Mount of Transfiguration, what happens? The cloud comes. The Father says, this is my son. Listen to him. And what does verse 36 say? Jesus Christ was left alone. You know what it's saying? The glory of Christ eclipsed the glory of Moses and Elijah. That was a signal to us. It's what the author of Hebrews is going to tell us. What the Holy Spirit's going to do through Hebrews is just like on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's going to take each piece of Judaism and he's going to carefully compare it to the glory of Christ. And what we're going to see from the prophets to angels to the high priest to the Levitical priest order to the tabernacle to the old covenant and on and on and on every piece, the Holy Spirit's going to compare it to the glory of Christ. And what's going to happen is the glory of Jesus is going to completely eclipse everything out of the old covenant. And God is going to masterfully take our eyes and he's going to put them solely on Jesus who is the center of heaven and should be the center of our lives. It's exhilarating. It's thrilling. And the way he begins to do it, and this is what I want to examine today, the first step in this path is he's going to say, Christ, whom God appointed, heir of all things through whom he created the world. So let's attempt to understand this. If Christ is the creator, and indeed he is, the scriptures say, Colossians 1.16, that there wasn't anything not made by Christ. Through him, everything was made. Hebrews 1.3 says, uh, says that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verses 2 and 3, he created all things, John says. Christ is the creator. Well, if he is indeed the creator, and he is then why would he be appointed? What does the author mean? Well, let's dig into this this morning. If you're going to take notes, I first want you to know what Christ is appointed unto. In the eternal counsel of God, the Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, You say, Chad, how do you fully explain the Trinity? Well, let me save you some time. You can't. But let me tell you this. Don't ever forget this. A God who is so small that he can be fully understood is not a God so big that he should be worshipped. I do not have to understand everything about God in order to worship him. 
If I could understand everything about God, then why would I need him? I am okay with the unsearchable ways of God. And what the Bible teaches over and over throughout the entire counsel of God's word from the very beginning is that God exists as a trinity, three in one. In other words, in the entire universe, there is only one essence of God, and it is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three, yet one. Someone as well said, you try to explain the Trinity, you may lose your mind. You try to explain it away, you may lose your soul. But from the very beginning, when God says, in the beginning, Genesis 1-1, God, Elohim, is the Hebrew word for that which means plurality. God says, let us make man in our image. Who is he speaking to? The eternal counsel. The Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Remember when Isaiah goes into heaven, Isaiah chapter 6, and he sees the Lord, the King on the throne, and God says, who shall we send for us? Who is he speaking to? The angels? No. The Trinity. Over and over, we see it in creation. We see it in salvation. Over and over and over, we see it in Christ's baptism. The Trinity. And the scriptures say that the the Godhead dwelt within Christ bodily. We see the Trinity all throughout the Bible. And so it is in our salvation. The Father planned our salvation. The Son purchased our salvation, and it's the precious Holy Spirit that indwells us. He personalizes our salvation. And so we see that Christ, within the Trinity, within the Godhead, is appointed. What does that mean? If you want to take notes, I want you to note this. Christ, according to the Scriptures, was appointed to two things. Number one, he was appointed to suffer. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Christ was appointed to suffer. You realize that when sin entered the world, God did not call an emergency trinity meeting. Did you know that? God did not bite his nails. God did not pace the floors of heaven. God did not go back to a whiteboard and say, what are we going to do? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says that Christ was foreknown before the foundations of the world that he would suffer and die the death. Acts chapter 4, oh, I believe you'll have to fact check me. I believe it's Acts chapter 4, oh, I can't remember the text now, the exact reference. But it says that what did the Jews do? What did the Romans do? They did everything that the hand of God had planned and predestined. It was known before the foundations of the world were ever laid that Christ would be the slain Lamb of God for the sins of the world that was appointed in the heavenly councils. He was not only appointed to suffer, 1 Peter 1.11, 1 Peter 1.20. These scriptures also teach he was appointed to glory, a unique glory. And you know what I'm so thankful for? John chapter 17, verse 22. Did you know that Jesus shares his glory with us? Jesus shares that glory. And he was appointed to it. Although he is the creator, and indeed he is, he was also appointed heir. He was assigned. He was appointed to suffer the death of the cross. What it means is that God had a solution before there was ever a problem. It meant that God ordained. It meant that God orchestrated the events of history before Satan ever came onto the scene. You know, we we erroneously sometimes view that Jesus and Satan are arch enemies. Or that they are rivals. That's the better term. Did you know Satan is not the rival of Jesus? He's no match 
He's no comparison. According to the scriptures, do you know who the rival of Satan is? Michael, the archangel. Satan was an archangel. And Michael is his rival, not the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the creator. Don't ever put Jesus on the same playing field, the same level as Satan himself, because it is no equal. Now, he was appointed. What does that mean? He was ordained. He was commissioned. He was set aside to suffer the death of the cross. It was already planned in the heart of God before the Garden of Eden ever came about, before Satan ever slithered in, before Eve was ever deceived, and before Adam ever rebelled. It was already planned in the mind and the heart of God that Christ should die and suffer on the cross. You know what that tells me? That tells me God is in control from beginning all the way to the ending. Amen? He was appointed. Now, let's understand this. What does the word heir mean? What a beautiful term for Christ. The heir of all things. I want you to note this. This speaks of the domain. It speaks of the dominion of Jesus. What is an heir? Well, we even know in our culture today, an heir is someone who is going to inherit. This means that Christ is the owner. He is the possessor. Why is he the owner? Because he's the creator. Through whom he created the world. Christ. Let me tell you what the Bible says. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein. Amen. Christ owns everything. He is the possessor of all things. He is the heir of God. Now, friends, let's understand what Christ meant here. What was he appointed to? He was appointed to suffer. He was appointed to die. He was appointed to rise again. He was appointed to glory. That he has been given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess. He's appointed unto these things. Go to Mark chapter 12 for one moment. Mark chapter 12. Now, Jesus, this is remarkable to me when you link these two scriptures together, that he is the heir of all things. But how did he take possession as the heir? Through his death, through his suffering, through his humility, through his obedience. Isn't that what Philippians 2 tells us? That he humbled himself, being obedient even to the point of the cross. Mark chapter 12, Jesus is going to tell a parable. Now remember, what's the scripture say? In these last days, Jesus is speaking, God is speaking in son, in the language of Jesus. So Jesus is going to teach a parable. He says that an owner, who is God the Father, planted a vineyard. A vineyard in scripture always represents Israel going all the way back to Jeremiah and to the prophets. And God sent people, the owner of the vineyard, sent his servants to collect the vineyard. And what did the people do? They made them suffer. Some they beat, some they killed, according to what Jesus said. This goes directly to what Hebrews 1 says. God spoke many times in many ways. God spoke to our fathers by who? Through who? The prophets. This is exactly who Jesus is explaining. And so God sent his servants. He sent his prophets. Some were beaten. Some were killed. And then God said, I have a beloved son whom I will send. And look at verse 7. What did those wicked people say? What did those wicked people do? They said, oh, the heir. Who is Christ? He is the heir of all things. And what did they say? Oh, the heir. If we kill him, what will be ours? The inheritance. Satan has always been after the inheritance. 
What did Satan say to Jesus in the wilderness when he said, here's all the kingdoms of the world. Fall down and worship me, and I'll give you all of these kingdoms right now. You know what he was telling Jesus? He was saying, take the easy way out. Bypass your suffering. Bypass Calvary. Don't go to the cross. Don't go through the shame. Don't go through the agony. I will hand it to you right here, right now. He was saying, take the easy way out. But no, what was Christ appointed to? Suffering. Christ came to die. And Satan tried to get him to take the easier path. Does he not do the same to us today? Does he not try to get us to take the easy way out? I'm going to show you in just a moment, and I'm going to show you through the scriptures. People always ask, why does God allow suffering? I'm going to show you through the scriptures. God not only allows it, he appoints it just like he did for Christ. And I'm going to show you why. Because it all has to do with our inheritance. Satan is always after the inheritance. But do you know what 1 Peter 1 says? It is reserved in heaven. It is kept. It is safe. It is undefiled. It is never fading away. Hallelujah. God has it well in hand. Amen? So, Jesus the owner, the proprietor, the heir, comes. And what does John 1, 12 tell us? He came to his own and his own received him not, but to as many as did receive him, to them gave he the right or the power to become the sons of God. His own did not, they rejected him. The stone that the builders rejected, right? Well, so here they come and, Christ comes to the nation. They kill him, according as Mark 12, 7 is going to tell us. Jesus paid the ultimate price to be the heir of all things. And what, did the, what was the price that he paid? The cross of Calvary. And why did he pay it? Because according to the scriptures, he was appointed to it. I don't know about you, but these are fascinating scriptures to me. He is the heir. He is the owner. He is the proprietor of all things. Everything that the father owns, the son owns. Amen. He is the heir of God. Now, what's the implications for us? I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. By Christ being the heir of God, that means that he has the ability, he has the legal authority to make good on every promise of God. (laughs) So what does that mean for us? That means that when the scriptures tell me, Chad, you are loved with an everlasting love. What do I do when I don't feel loved by God? I believe the word of God. I take hold of the promises of God. What do I do when I say, God, the circumstances I find myself in, the problems that I'm facing, the things that I can't control, then God, that doesn't tell me that you love me. I'm able to go back to the word and say, no, God's promises are true. They are yes and amen through Jesus Christ. And God says, I have loved you, Chad with a consistent, with a stable, with an everlasting love. You see what I'm saying? And how do I know it's true? Because Christ is the heir of all things. Every promise of God, they are yes and amen through Jesus Christ. Amen? Why? Because he's the owner. He's the proprietor. He is the heir of every promise. So what do I do when I go to the scriptures and it says, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Nothing in all of creation. Amen. How do I know it's true? Because Christ is the heir. 
The Bible says one day he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. How do we know that's true? Because God appointed him to be heir of all things. Amen. One day death will be no more. How do you and I know that when we stand before God and that second death comes and throws people into the lake of fire, how do we know that the second death will not harm us? Because Christ has been appointed the heir of all things. Amen. So what's the implication for me? That tells me everything I face in life, everything I face in death, everything I face in eternity is secure through the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the owner of it all. Amen. Amen. Do you see the implications of this phrase? Do you see why the author of Hebrews, as is going to be the theme, that Christ is sufficient, Christ is supreme, Christ is above all things. And when you compare anything, any problem you face, any hardship you have, any joy that you experience in life, when you compare anything to the glory of Christ, the glory of Christ eclipses it all. It's a deep, deep well that you and I can drink from today. He is appointed the heir of all things. What does it mean of all things? (laughs) It means everything visible and everything invisible. Everything in the natural realm and everything in the supernatural realm. Everything on earth and everything in heaven. He is the heir of it all. Amen. I want you to think with me for a moment how poor the Lord Jesus was when he came to this earth. He was born of a virgin. There was no place to lay his head. Born, you know, our little Christmas cards show us these cute stables. You know what a stable would have been in Judea at this time, it had been a cave, a damp. You imagine being in a damp cave with animals? It didn't smell too good, I wouldn't think. And he came and he was poor. We know he was poor throughout his life. What did he say? The foxes have holes in the birds of the air. They have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Think about it. The creator of the universe never owned a home. Think about that. We know he was poor, especially within his death. For even the garments that he wore were stolen from him and gambled upon. He was poor. When he breathed his last, and Joseph of Arimathea took him down off of that cross. Where did they lay him? They laid him in the borrowed tomb that didn't belong to his family because they were poor. And all the while, he was the heir of all things. When it comes to Christ, things are not always as they seem. And when it comes to your life and the sufferings that you face, And the questions that you go through. Not everything is as it seems. And here Christ was. Poverty. But all the while, what was he doing? For our sake. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake. He who knew no sin. Became sin. That we might become the righteousness of God. In closing today, I'm going to ask you to go to Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. And let me explain this for a moment. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. What is God doing through the heirship of Christ? Well, he's doing something quite remarkable, something quite outstanding. The scriptures say, and this is reinforced in Galatians chapter 4. That we, Galatians 4 says, we who were slaves are no longer slaves, but we are made sons. 
And if sons, then heirs of God. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 teach us that we are now sons of God. If you'll read Romans 8 and Galatians 4 together, a lot of dots will begin to connect for you. And you'll see how in our hearts, God put his spirit within us. And now we can cry out, Abba, Father. Why? Because the spirit of God has made us sons. To as many believed in him, to them gave he the right, the power to become the sons of God. Remarkable. And now, <laughs> now we have become the heirs of God just like Jesus. Do you realize we share in everything that Jesus has done? We share in it. But look at the last phrase of Romans 8, 17. The last phrase, provided you suffer with him. For those who suffer with him will also reign with him. So let me ask you a question today, precious people. Do you despise your sufferings? You shouldn't. Do you get angry at God over what you go through? You shouldn't. Do you question why does God allow this? No, that's the wrong question. The right question is what has God appointed for me? Because just as God appointed for Christ... He is appointed for us. And you know what that means? When you and I go through these appointments, James 1, 2, you and I can count it all joy when we encounter trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Amen? That word encounter is the opposite of the word haphazard. It's opposite of coincidental. And some of you, I want you to hear me today. Some of you are mad at God. Some of you are hurt by God. Some of you are let down by God because you see the things you're facing in life as haphazard and coincidental. And friends, they are not. The word encounter there means a scheduled calendar appointment. And I'm telling you today, based on the authority of the word of God, God will appoint seasons of suffering for you. But why? Because John 17, 22, God has also appointed glory for you. And how do you get to the glory of God is when you suffer for the glory of God. Amen. So don't despise what you're facing today. Don't get angry at God over what you're facing. Don't feel let down by God. Why? Because he's making you an heir. He's making you an heir. He's making you an heir. And what's the guarantee? And what's the promise? Is that Christ is the heir of all things. Let's bow our heads today. What is it that you're facing? That this one phrase of the word of God could change your perspective. What is it that you're facing today that you say, Chad, I've been hurt. I've gotten mad. I've gotten my feelings all riled up. And all the while, I did not know God's making me an heir. Uh, quite frankly, Maybe we need to apologize to God. Oh, make us heirs, Lord Jesus. And let us walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And that means to know you. Not just in the power of your resurrection but also in the fellowship of your sufferings. That means to drink from the cup of suffering. We all want the glory, few of us. 
will accept the suffering. Make us heirs, God. One of the unique glories of Christ is that you were appointed heir of all things. Help me not to lose sight of that, Jesus. You're over all things. You're over light, you're over darkness. You are over eyesight and you are over blindness. You're the heir of all things. In you I can trust. In you I can rest. You're... And as if that was not enough, have we not been given the Holy Spirit as the guarantor of the seal of promise? Oh, you're just too wonderful, Lord. So for us who sometimes feel let down, sometimes we pray and nothing happens and we get our feelings hurt. Forgive us, Lord God. Sometimes we want you to speak to us the things that we want to hear. But in reality, your final and decisive word is Jesus. You have spoken and you are speaking. And it's in the language of Jesus. And today, the word you're speaking to me today is that I'm secure and I am safe because Christ was appointed heir of all things. You're the creator, you're the sustainer of all things. You create the ages and you create the physical world. You're the creator of this universe. sustain me and you'll sustain your people you know I just I feel it so deeply in my heart right now as you're praying I I just can't I I just wasn't in my preparations but I feel it so strong right now Uh, there's some you need to apologize to the Lord you need to apologize You need to repent today and say, God, I've been angry at you. I've not understood why you've allowed things to go in my life the way they have. But I'm telling you, child of God, I'm telling you, I am telling you on the authority of the scriptures. God appoints us to things. And that means that if he's appointed us to things, that the God of all grace will get you through it. So don't get angry. Don't get hurt. Don't despise. Embrace God. Don't run from him. Embrace him. Don't stub up on him. Embrace him. Don't rebel against him. Embrace him. Don't question him. Embrace him.